From Safe Harbor Cambria on the California Central Coast, two bells have sounded, and it is time for us to draw into this holy hour on this, the Lord's Day, on the second Sunday of Easter. We've had a couple of technical problems to deal with here. They're taken care of, and we are now ready to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. So let us breathe deeply, centering our thoughts, as we listen to meditation music played by Jack. Decided on that choice today. That is, that is, that is wonderful. It reminds us of the <laughs> continuum. In the name of our Lord, grace and peace, and welcome to Safe Harbor Presbyterian. Friends gathered to support each other, to serve in the light of Christ, to inform our faith, and to be a safe harbor of love and acceptance. And we are glad that you are with us here in the sanctuary. Uh, in Cambria, on our Zoom family, watching on Facebook Live, or from our YouTube channel, you are welcomed here. Love is spoken here. Uh, the study sheets, those wonderful lesson plans that Eugenia prepares for each of her sermons, are now available, and the entire library is becoming available on our website. Uh, that is our that is our website, and it, it, there's an index there. There is a file you can access them by date, and they are just absolutely wonderful to have. Uh, also, our devotional and inspirational moments are available on Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram, and uh, we continue to receive prayer requests and wonderful thoughts from people. So you might share those with people who could use it, as we all can. Um, Again today, the center candle shines for yet one more mass shooting in the United States and for the victims who continue to suffer from warfare, uh, barbarism in the world. And so it, uh, it shines brightly, and we remember that in our prayers today. Let us begin our worship. Our liturgist today is Julia. stand if you are able. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. We come to worship the Holy Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now our prayer of adoration Join me, my Lord and, and my, my God. God. Our, Our hearts, hearts beat with alleluia. Your, Your risen strength changes life. You have breathed the Holy Spirit into humanity. You provide forgiveness and call us to do likewise. You have created the church. You propound the mystery of love. Your divine incarnation calls us to our eternal destiny. My Lord, Lord and my God, my God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Amen. And we'll sing hymn 248, Christ is Risen, shout, Hosanna.
May be seated. <clears throat> now a direct prayer of confession. Our prayer of confession includes a portion of a letter of faith written by an early Christian leader, Ignatius of Anticot, who was executed in Rome in the second century. Wrote a series of letters, including to the, to the Romans who killed him. It is thought he was no, he was thrown to the wild beasts. Let us read his words. May, May nothing seen or unseen begrudge me of making my way to Jesus Christ. Come the fire, cross, battling with wild beasts, wrenching of bones, mangling of limbs, crushing of my whole body, cruel tortures of the devil only. Only let me go to Jesus Christ. Not the wide bounds of earth nor the kingdoms of this world will avail me anything. I would rather die and get to Jesus Christ than reign over the ends of the earth. That is whom I am looking for, the one, the one who died for us. That is whom I want, the one who rose for us. Lord, in these moments of silence, help us to gauge our strength of faith. Precious Lord, use our doubts to let us know. Give us courage and humble confidence that come what may, we will serve and rejoice in your life. Amen. Friends, the great good news of the gospel is this, that as far as the east is from the west, so far has our God removed our sin from us. Alleluia. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. This is the very truth of your life. And those moments when you think that the things you've left undone are just reprehensible, and maybe they are. In those moments when you think that the things that you have done are reprehensible, and maybe they are. Remember this moment, because this moment makes those moments irrelevant as far as God is concerned. Now, you all know, we've lived long enough to know that sometimes our errors, sometimes our mistakes, if we will do the work of transformation, can be the making of us. So we don't necessarily forget the things that we have done wrong. We learn from them. We change from them. But the scriptures tell us that God chooses to forget them. God remembers them no more. So you don't have to move through your life with your shoulders bent. You don't have to stay awake at night wondering, how could I? What was I thinking? How, you know, is God mad at me? Bring it all to God. Let it go. God is not mad at you. God is in love with you and wants nothing more than to draw close to you in every situation of pain or failure or frustration or joy. So knowing that we are all forgiven and freed in Christ Jesus, I invite you, wherever you are worshiping with us today, uh, to take a moment to share and the peace of Christ with one another, saying, peace be with you.
Thank you, Jack. I'm so grateful to the congregation for not allowing me to fly right past that. That was, that was wonderful and I'm very, very grateful. Um, so now let's prepare ourselves for the word by singing together our chant, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see. This afternoon, <clears throat> our gospel text continues where you left off last week, I think, in John's gospel in the 20th chapter we're going to pick up today at verse 19. Uh, this particular text that we're working with today was one of the first texts that I ever preached on in my ministry. I actually preached on this text uh, in my trials for ordination when I was approved for ordination. And that will be, uh, that was 39 years ago this month. And it's a text that has captured my heart and my soul all these years, and it just keeps unfolding. So today we're gonna, we're gonna go back at this story again. Let me give you a little bit of background. Now, remember that we are in the early days still of our Easter season celebration. Those of you in the sanctuary can still smell the lilies. Uh, maybe for all of us, there is still some leftover ham in the fridge and we're wondering what to do with it. Do we grind it up and make salad or do we put it into an omelet? Maybe there are even uh, still a few chocolate eggs and peeps in our Easter baskets. And maybe you, like I have, have covered your Lenten prayer trees with white lights and white ribbons, eggs and butterflies. Or maybe, maybe you are just done with it all, moved on, Tomb empty once again. Phew, now we can go back to work or school or to the dentist appointment and live life as usual. Our lives as usual that frankly feel not so much like resurrection life as we might want it to, want them to. But the church, the church does not per permit that going back to life as usual. The church insists that we celebrate Easter for 50 days, longer by 10 days than the time we spent in Lent preparing for Easter. Why? Always because joy is bigger in the Christian faith than pain or even than sin. Actually, the reason why we have Sundays in Lent rather than of Lent, is because the Sundays are technically not a part of the Lenten season. Why? Because every Sunday is a feast day of the resurrection. Each Eucharist is a feast of the resurrection. No matter what is going on with us or around us, it is a celebration of new life. So once again, on the second Sunday of Easter, we gather ourselves together to focus on the resurrection, 
and on Jesus' appearances to his friends, and on what that means for us, for our lives. As always, we began on the first Easter evening with the disciples terrified and cowering behind locked doors. They are still no doubt fearing that maybe, just maybe, Mary has lost her mind again. Maybe they are still feel, fearing that the authorities have somehow pulled a fast one. Maybe they are behind those locked doors, fearing that they themselves are in grave danger now. Maybe they're still reeling from the fact that all of their certainties have crumbled around them, even about death, and they do not know which way to hop. There are dangers everywhere. Now, for millennia, preachers and theologians, and I've done it myself, have focused on Thomas as the central character next to Jesus, of course, in this story, and they have disparaged him and held him up as doubter in chief. Now, in my view, that is spectacularly unfair. Not only does the word doubt not appear anywhere in the Greek text, but Thomas is only asking for the same experience that the other disciples have already had to see for himself. So in my view, this is a text about faith, not about doubt. After all, that word is not used here. We can talk about that another time. Um, and I'll talk with you more about the word that is used here in just a minute. So as we hear this familiar story again this year, I want to ask you in your memories to just kind of review your memory for a moment and, and imagine, see if you can remember moments in your own life when everything has fallen apart, moments when you just felt like you were coming apart at the seams and when nothing seemed to work that you tried to do and nothing that always used to work still works. See if you can remember moments when you felt overwhelmed with grief or afraid to put your foot in the water anywhere because everything seemed so dangerous and uncertain. And you suddenly felt that you didn't have the resources that you had come to rely upon. Imagine those times when you felt that you were the hunted one or when you knew that there were ones who really did wish you harm. Imagine for a moment those moments. Those are the moments that surround the characters in the story we're just going to read. Imagine those moments in your life and those feelings. And imagine as well the walls, the sturdy locked doors behind which you hide when those kinds of times crash upon you. And see if you listen to this text and we ponder it together. See if you can see how Jesus addresses your circumstances, your feelings, and your inevitable and useless barriers. There is one other thing I just wanted to say. There is a major emphasis in this text that I'm not going to deal with at all today. And that is that Jesus gives the disciples the power to hold on to or to release sin. I deal with that in the study sheet if you want to go there. There's an awful lot to unpack in that. In general, though, just so you don't get your mind in a spin as you hear this text, what Jesus is saying to them and us is that we are to be his body now. The release we offer others is effective. It is as effective as if he were doing it, because indeed he is doing it through us. And our failure 
to offer that release to others is destructive. And we can talk about that all more another day. But today, I want to focus on the big concept here, faith, especially faith in dangerous times. So with that in mind, listen for the word of God. Ready to receive. John's Gospel, chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. <clears throat> when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven, forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And a week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks. When I was a pastor in the Denver metro area, I lived in a beautiful apartment with a Colorado blue spruce tree outside my living room window. And nothing gave me a cozier feeling than sitting in my comfy chair with a cup of coffee and watching the snow fall and weigh down the beautifully sturdy branches. I didn't have a mountain view in my apartment, but my patio opened onto a beautiful meadow. And sometimes the meadow was filled with wildflowers. Sometimes it was filled with deer tracks in the snow and little antelope you could see going across in that area. Sometimes it was filled just with summer grasses. Now, granted, the winters in Denver were a shock to me, cozy feeling or not. And one year on Memorial Day, it was snowing. And I decided that summer would finally come if I primed the pump a bit and went and bought a barbecue grill for my patio. So I got in my car, pouring down snow, in end of May now, pouring down snow and headed across town to a mall that had advertised a sale. Near the mall where two big, multi-lane freeways met, traffic suddenly lurched to a stop. I had no idea what was going on until I saw a beautiful young dog running around the traffic trailing a pink leash. 
people were trying to catch her to no avail. And I, I thought I would help as well. I opened my door to lend a hand and the little thing jumped in my car and crouched on the floorboard in the passenger side. All the people got back in their cars, but nobody came to look for the dog. She was bleeding and I thought that she had been hit. So I took her to my vet and as it turned out, she had not been hit by a car. Rather, she had been beaten by a chain until she was bloody. And the vet called the vet that was on her tags and the, that vet called the owner and they said, oh, well, we were disciplining her and she pulled away and we just decided we didn't want her anymore. And that is how my first case on Kesey entered my life. She was sweet, but terrified from the start. I already had a small terrier, Megan, who basically just rolled her eyes, but did not complain. For days, Kesey sat trembling under the dining room table. She would only eat out of my hand, although she didn't complain at all about going out on a leash. One night, I was sitting in my big chair with little Megan beside me and I saw Kesey under the dining room table, get up and sit down, get up and sit down several times. And finally, I could almost see her gather her courage and she sprang from under the table and leapt into my lap. Megan did complain that time, I'll have to admit, but that night was a turning point. A month or two later, she had progressed to the point that sometimes I let her off leash to run in the meadow. She loved it. One day I'd come home from church on my lunch hour to walk the dogs and Kesey ran like the wind in the meadow that day. When I became anxious that she would go too far, I called to her and she seemed to pivot in midair. She ran back, sat down beside me, took the hem of my skirt in her mouth and looked up in adoration while she waited for further instructions. And I remember thinking in that moment that I was witnessing exactly what the Bible talks about as faith or faithfulness. And it was in that moment as if I could hear in muted woofs, and as if I could see in shining eyes, the kind, uh, as if I could see and hear the kind of faith that tumbled from Thomas in this morning's text. My Lord, the one who gets to set the rules, and my God, the one who loves, and saves. Kesey, Thomas, you, me, misty-eyed all of us in wonder at what grace can really change. The word that is used throughout the New Testament and translated as both faith and believe in various places uh, is the Greek word pistis in all of its many forms. And only rarely does it have seem to have something to do with the content of belief, like we would use the word that use it that way when we'd say statement of faith. Very rarely in the New Testament does this is this word used in that way. In the vast majority of cases, as I would submit is true in today's passage, it means to trust, to rely upon, and in so doing, then to become trustworthy, to trust to rely upon and to become trustworthy. To have faith is to come to trust that the trustworthy and faithful God who will never abandon us, who will never leave us comfortless, as Jesus said earlier in John, who will always reach out to save, 
to have faith is to come to trust that that one is someone we can actually rely upon. The moment when Thomas met the risen Christ was just such a moment for him. He had been hovering like Kesey under the dining table for a week, not knowing what in the world he could depend upon now. But when Jesus came to him in his time of turmoil, in his time of pain, Thomas jumped up and leapt in his lap, so to speak, and nothing would be the same again. After all, you see, there is no hiding place anywhere if even death is no barrier to life. And from that moment, when the, when the moment dawns that that is the truth, from that moment for Thomas, when that dawned until his death, Thomas belonged to Jesus. And even after his death, I would submit no doubt, but throughout the rest of his life, Thomas stayed close, he listened up, and he relied upon Jesus. Well, we are neither Thomas nor beaten pups, even though we may sometimes feel like it. So what do we do? How do we go from hiding under the table or behind locked doors? How do we go from hiding behind the locked doors of our own broken hearts, our own broken world? How do we get to a point where we run free in the meadow knowing that we are safe because the Savior is there? knowing that we are safe and saved as long as we keep our ear tuned to the voice of the master. In other words, how do we come to trust in Jesus when all around us the evidence seems lacking, maybe just because it does not present itself in the form we want or expect? What do we do? One of the things that has completely captivated my thoughts this week has hit me in a way it never has before uh, from the whole of the 20th chapter of John is the little phrase with which John begins his resurrection story earlier in the chapter. He starts by saying, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, while it was still dark, even while his friends, while Jesus' friends slumbered the fitful, muscle-cramping sleep of grief, even knowing that there was nothing she could do, Mary got up and went just to be close to him. Even then, while it was still dark, even then, already then, the tomb was empty. The grave clothes folded, needed no longer, while it was still dark. Even then, the work of God to defy death, to defy the death dealing, to insist on eternal intimacy with us, to declare that frightened power, the status quo, and rigid religiosity would never have the last word, that dangerous times are no match for love, even then, when there was was no evidence of that at all. The work was done. It is finished, Jesus said from the cross. Never will be finished, he says from the empty tomb. Not now, not forever. There is no end for you. While it was still dark, and while it is still dark, those, the tomb is already empty. 
there's a lot of darkness in our world these days, a lot that looks nothing at all like the light of love that is the path that is our guaranteed path of life. I don't know if any of you have been aware of the events that have unfolded over the last two weeks in Tennessee politics. In case you haven't heard, uh, three Tennessee state legislators, two young black men and one 60-year-old white woman protested on the state house floor because the Speaker of the House would not allow discussion on gun reform even after a massacre at a local school in Nashville. And in a bald display of both racism and sexism, the two young men were expelled from the body and the woman by one vote remained, bless her little heart, she just didn't know no better. <laughs> the fact that all this went down on Monday, Thursday, the night of bald isms and betrayal was not lost on me. And yet, while it was still dark, a fire was lit. Thousands of people, multi-generations, multi-racial, multi-faith came to life, rose from the couch, if not the grave, and headed out into the night, be, being themselves the light. It was a beautiful thing to see. And on the day that Justin Pearson, one of the expelled young men, who speaks, I tell you, for all the world with the power of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X bound together in one body on the day that he was reinstated by his home district county commission in Memphis. He stood before the crowds, 27 years old, quoting the Bible with his fists lifted in the air, filled with a power that left me breathless. And you know what he said? He said to that crowd, he said to us, he said, you cannot expel hope. Could that have been a bit of what Thomas felt that evening, a, a week after disaster befell them all, when, when Jesus stood before him, was Jesus saying to him, Thomas, you can't expel hope. You can't lock me out. The death-dealing powers of this world cannot shut me out. They cannot kill me out. Did Thomas, as he stood there shivering by lamplight, looking into the very face of divine love in some kind of new skin, did Thomas scratch his chin and mutter to himself, no, nope, I guess nothing in the vast realm of heaven and earth can rid us of hope? I think so. One of the things that I find most touching in this story is that Jesus offers his wounds as the evidence of his identity. We have no idea about resurrection bodies. The Bible gives us next to nothing. All we know is that at least as was the case with Jesus, they don't look much like our earthly bodies. Nobody loved Jesus more than Mary Magdalene, and she didn't recognize him until he called her name. All we know is that apparently, at least for Jesus, all the physics change. He could walk through doors, he could rise from death, and he could even spend a few minutes joyfully working in the garden while he waited for Mary to come, as he surely knew she would. We know next to nothing about all of that and, and completely nothing about what it will mean to us 
except that we are told that we have become the body of Christ. We are filled, as we read earlier in this in today's text, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Christ's Spirit is inside of us. So indeed, there may be some similarities. But what I love about this mystery is that Jesus in his resurrected body brings his wounds with him transformed, no doubt, but still identifiable. It is when we hear his intimate voice that we know him, like Mary Magdalene, and it is when we look at his wounds that we know him too, like Thomas. When Jesus stands before Thomas, giving him the opportunity not just to view his wounds, but to actually enter into them, that is so poignant. Put your finger here. Put your hand in here. When he does that, he shows us, in my opinion, that to come to faith truly, to come to rely upon God deeply, to come to believe that God is trustworthy in everything, we start by looking where it hurts. We start by looking at what hurting people do to hurting people, and we see that even that will not prevail. It's not without consequences, to be sure. In each of our lives and our poor battered country these days, there are, there are scars indeed. Hurt is real. Grief is real. Oppression is real. Gun violence is real. And, and yet, even while my friends in Louisville at the PCUSA headquarters huddled under their desks last week while a gunman shot up a bank a block away, even while they struggle to deal with their damaged hearts and spirits and emotions, while even while the dark is heavy, and while so much of the country has found a way to just move on from insanity to insanity, well, while an average of 116 people in this country are killed by gun violence every single day, and while there have been more mass shootings this year than there have been years this year, it was one here in Alabama last night, five people killed, birthday party. While all of that is true, it is not the only thing that is true. Evil and hopelessness, fear and abuse of power can do awful things, granted. Things with lasting repercussions, granted. Even so, even so, while it is still dark. Jesus stands before us, offering his word, offering his hands and sides as evidence, saying to us, this is what I believe down in my core. Jesus stands in the midst of hardship and says to us, I get it. I would, I, you know, I know what the hopeless worst looks like and does. I know what you are facing, and I know where it may take you. Even so, you can't expel hope. Even so, your scars will not be wasted. Even so, in dangerous times, light has already dawned. Now, coming to truly rely upon God is not always a straight or easy path, even if we are not thrust headlong into the chaos of powers and pain run amok. I had a wonderful feisty parishioner once who struggled all his life with faith. He was a wealthy businessman and really didn't much want the way of ethics to shape his choices. And when I talked with him about the welfare of his workers or the importance of justice ministries, he listened and he basically just patted me on my head. 
He had been raised in the church, baptized in the church, and even as a younger man served on the council of the church. But as he got older and richer and more powerful, he was beset with doubts and a kind of sterling apathy toward all things of faith. And even when he became terminally ill, he wasn't sure if the whole thing wasn't, as he put it, just bunk. We talked a lot in his last year, and I could see that as his body struggled, his soul was struggling too. How can you be so sure, Eugenia, he said to me one day while I was sitting by his bed at his request, reading the Psalms to him. And I'm sure I said something inane that I mercifully do not remember. We can't take that journey for each other after all. But a few days later, he slipped into a coma. And the family asked me to come again when it seemed that the end was near. So again, I sat by him reading the Psalms with the family and the hospice nurse standing all around his bed. And suddenly, He opened his eyes and seemed to be looking at someone standing elevated at the foot of the bed. Now, excuse my French. This is what he said. He said, I'll be damned. He said, it really is true. It was you all along. Now, did he see Jesus hovering above the ground at the foot of his bed, arms outstretched, scars clearly visible? I can't know, obviously, but I believe it. I pistis it. I trust it. I rely upon it. All I know is that he fairly shined at that moment. Every part of his body relaxed in that moment. His smile was electric in that moment. And within minutes, he died. Our statements of faith, like Thomas's, like Mary's, our statements of faith come in different ways, at different times, even in the midst of the darkness of a world that tries to expel hope. But here's the thing. We cannot and need not dwell in despair and confusion. All of our circumstances are held in the heart and the light of God. So whether we feel locked in death-dealing circumstances or confounded by our wild world and politics or facing our own mortality and its own deathbed declaration of trust, whether the night seems too long, we too can do what Mary did. We can get up even in the night, and go to get close to him. We too can do what Thomas did. We can find God and hope for the world, even in the old worn wounds that can still be transformed by grace. Even when alleluias feel hollow, hope remains in these dangerous times. Thanks be to God. Now, our hymn of response, I'm, this is the only time I think I have been glad I'm not in the sanctuary <laughs> today because y- y'all don't know this hymn and you hate it so much and you grind your teeth at me when I choose a hymn that you don't know. But this one, y'all, is so winsome and so beautiful that even as you struggle to croak it out, let the melody, it's an old Welsh melody, let the melody and the lyrics of this song um, touch your soul. Let's sing together. It is hymn number 231, Christ Has Risen While Earth Slumbers.
Thanks be to God. That was beautiful, y'all. Thank you so much. Please be seated and let's prepare our ourselves for our time of prayer by singing our chant, Come and Fill. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. As, as we go to God in prayer today, we have um, received a message from one of our online worshipers named Eliza, who would like the community to pray for her and for her family, uh, that the, the grace and the love of God can um, touch um, the whole family and um, do the mending that needs to be done there. I also wanted to ask a special prayer for uh, a new friend who's going to be worshiping with us online uh, named Judy, who's having some uh, health issues or just some just kind of basic struggles right now. Prayers for her. And also, I'd like to ask the congregation to pray, pray for me tomorrow. I'm going to be having a medical procedure tomorrow that um, doctors hope will help bring me some pain relief. Uh, and so I'm, I'm both apprehensive and looking forward to that at the same time. One of the things I wanted to point out about my uh, Easter tree is that this year I left the purple ribbons on uh, because Jesus came with his wounds into Easter time. And so I brought the prayers of our Lenten tree into, um, into our Easter tide and would, be, would love to tie uh, prayers uh, white ribbons on the tree. If you have prayers that you'd like for me in the community of faith to offer for you, if it's a need, if it's a joy, if it's just, I don't know what I need, uh, just get a message to us and I'll tie a ribbon for you and we'll pray, um, pray, add you in my prayers every day. So let us pray to God. Oh, gracious God, we thank you so much that, that you have shown us that there is nothing we can do to keep you out. Our disbelief doesn't keep you away. Our fear doesn't keep you away. Our inability to make sense of our lives and the mysteries of faith can't keep you away. There is nothing. All of that stuff that had so much seem, feels sometimes like it still has so much power over us. It is a sham. It is over. It is done. We are living in the light, y'all. Even when the world has not recognized that the candle is lit, even when we don't even know what new life is going to look like, even when the age old pains and isms and hatreds and illnesses rear their head and try to shake us, even then we make our prayer with Thomas, my Lord and my God, even then we make our prayer with the saints in all times and places, even at the grave saying, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Oh, gracious God, we know that your love is infinite. We don't even have the capacity to fully imagine it. We know that your grace is powerful. We don't even have the lens through which to view it. And we are so grateful, oh God. And we pray that you will use us. You have entered into us. So let us be 
your hands and feet. Let us go where the wounds are and show others our own so that they will know that it is your love that brings us to them. So that they will know that they, that they are safe with you. They can trust you. They can rely upon you. There is nothing that you cannot overcome for good. And so, gracious God, we pray for our needs, for the needs of the world, for all who are grieving and can't find their way. We pray for all those who think they've locked you out. We ask that you will gently show them that indeed you are with them all the time. And now, gracious God, we bind up all of our prayers in the words that you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our response to prayer is number 710. We are an offering. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we dedicate these funds. We know that our life is a mystery and that our service is a mystery as to how and who it reaches. We know that the love that we have comes from you and that we know that you are directing it to where you want it to go. We thank you for that. We dedicate all that we have and all that we receive in following your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of parting is number 246, Christ is Alive.
And now, sisters and brothers in Christ, may God bless you with discomfort, with discomfort, with easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you will live deeply and from the heart. And may God bless you with anger and injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people so that you will work for justice, freedom, and peace. And may God bless you with tears to shed for those that mourn so that you will reach out your hand to them and turn their mourning into joy. And may God bless you with just enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this old world so that you will do those things that others say cannot be done. And now may the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, the amazing love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this holy day and forever. Amen. I want to give a special shout out today to Monty. 